Leslie Choice, and my guest today is Greg Malone. He's one of the co-founders of CODCO, and he's also the author of a memoir called You Better Watch Out. Good to have you here on the show. Nice to be here, Leslie. Okay, so the book is about a chunk of your life. It's a time and a place. What time and place? It's um, a childhood drama about growing up in St. John's in the 50s and early 60s, I suppose. Yeah, it only goes up to grade nine, and so it, uh, it, it really is a childhood drama, and I was really fascinated about that whole period of my life. And, about, and I love uh, St. John's in those days, too, you know? We were just coming out of the old world and entering the new world. Yeah, know? I was going to say, and, you know, no offense here, but, you know, 1950 sounds like a long time ago. It is. <laughs> a long time ago. That's receding in the distance. And, like, I was born in 48, and Newfoundland was a country then. We weren't part of Canada yet. And we had a British governor, and we all drove on the left. It was, you know, it's more Europe, really, than, than uh, North America. But then, uh, like World War II, we just went to World War II, and that really changed everything. Everything was, you know, American-Canadian. After that, we entered the New World. And so this is just that, that first decade of, of that New World, that optimistic, naive, the innocent 50s. Yeah, so a good, good time to be grown up? It was. I found it a really exciting, magical time. In retrospect, I think I'm very lucky to have had uh, the people around me that I did. And, uh, and the, the city was, um, I had a lot of freedom. You know, you could roam around the city. You could, you know, you had to watch out for roaming packs of dogs. They also had the freedom of the city. And, you know, you know okay, I'll go around here now and don't go down that street because the, you know, the dins might get you and don't go up that street because the O'Brien's up there. <laughs> you know, it was like that. But still, you had a lot of freedom uh, to explore. And I love that. Uh, so uh, it was a magical time, and I was also fascinated by my parents' story, too, who had, who had, whose courtship was in the 40s and during the war years, and, and they had just such great stories that used to keep me entranced in my Auntie Vera. So I was, I was, uh, it was a challenge after writing some of the harrowing chapters first with my father and that to go back and, and recreate their early lives and to recreate them as characters before you saw them as parents. But I felt it was important to do that. So you really get a, an, an impression of who these people were. You know? Now, you, you claim that you had the so-called perfect family. Well, how, how could that be? Our dysfunction was less visible <laughs> than poor Auntie Vera's family, whose dysfunction was visible for the world to see, you know? Uh, but uh, no, the, and, and like I said, people, mom and dad were kind of a famous couple. You know, they were very glamorous and uh, very vivacious. They had a, ga a gang of friends, and dad was the coach of the champion basketball team and mom was a tennis player. They were very on the go like that. And so when they got married, it was a big deal. And, uh, and they had the four boys and they were all perfectly turned out and they were still very glamorous. And everyone said, my God, Greg, you've got the perfect family. Your father is so good to you, Greg. You know, well, no, you know. <laughs> Did you kind of hate it after a while? <laughs> well, after a while, you think maybe I'm not so perfect. I don't seem to fit this picture. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> tell know? us about you as a yeah. child. What were you like? So then uh, I was I was pretty high spirited little kid, and uh, but I was very much into dress up, dressing up, and theatrical games and plays and all the time and stuff of that right. So they they cut they cut me off on dressing up as a, as the teach as a woman teacher at a certain point. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I had to go back to kings and queens and stuff like that, right? or kings, uh, and uh, but I didn't fit in. Now in, the, I, in the book, there's no such word as gay or homosexual because I never knew those words. I never knew the word homosexual till I suppose grade 10, read it in Time magazine. Oh my God, <laughs> that's what I am. And uh, you know, sissies, you were, you were a sissy or you weren't. Uh, and there was no word even for like jock. That's a, that was a relatively new term in the 60s when people got, you know, you, you were nerds, you were jocks, you were this, you were that. We didn't have any of that, even though we had all the people, we didn't have the names for them. So uh, I wanted to present the world in those terms as we saw it then and, and as I, and, because I didn't have any knowledge as a little kid of, the, of, of what I was. Right. So you found out that very slowly. And you edited yourself a little bit here, and then you started to edit yourself there. Better not to say that. And so you finally, by puberty, you find yourself in some kind of a box. Well, now, you, you seem to recall things very vividly. Mm. You know, how, how is that? Is, do you think that's accurately the way it really was, or do you think it's all been transmuted by, yeah. you know, memory and emotion and everything over time? How will we ever know? Everything is recorded in the ether, right? Uh, that's what I think. It's all there. But uh, some of my memories are vivid. I like colors and smells and voices and faces and stuff. Are, I, I feel they're there. Of course, they're only my memories. I was going to call the book My Faulty Memories. But 
you know, everyone's memory. I'd like to see someone else's memory of the same event. It was, it was uh, more challenging to reconstruct dialogue, right? Because you really want dialogue. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And you can't remember whole conversations, or you think you can, but you can remember sort of what happened in the conversation, and also some key lines. Some words I do remember, you know? That's what was said to me. I'd never forget that, you know? And so you take those lines, and then you remember how the person used to speak anyway, and you figure how the conversation must have started, and you recreate a conversation which is a facsimile of the event. But it has several authentic lines in it, usually. And right, and it's so more. necessary to have the dialogue to you know, bring yeah. that, that time and place back, yeah. Uh, yeah. back al alive, for totally. sure. Totally, yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more about St. John's of your childhood. I mean, give me a, you know, a picture somewhere. Walk me down the street. Oh, it's, it was a great old town. You know, the little harbors there, which is a perfect little oval harbor surrounded by hills, and that was filled with like the white fleet from Portugal, for instance, all these white boats with their masts, right, and all the sailors on the deck and playing soccer on the wharf. It was great, and you would go aboard their boats and they'd give you something to drink or a slice of sausage or something like that, and, and you, uh, they would throw boats to be, you know, three deep uh, moored in the harbor and all along the harbor and all you'd see was these beautiful white masts and you know these rusting old white ships and and all these new guys in town and then they would leave and then all the Koreans would be in and the Germans so it was, it was a small town but it was a very international town you had Americans and Canadians well we were Canadians by then but we had a lot of Europeans and, and Asian boats coming through it was uh, it was a lot of fun and the, the, the city itself is so beautiful, too, because you don't have to, it's, it's sort of contained within that downtown area and um, little laneways and alleyways and, and uh, more poverty in those days. I saw some shocking sights. But then you only have to look up and you see the hills in the distance covered with berries or snow and, you know, this, and, or the ocean out that way, the ocean that way. So it's, it's a really beautiful city to yeah, walk well, around yeah, in. And, I can and tell you have a you know, really strong affection for that place. Yeah. We're going to take a, a short break. My guest today is Greg Malone, and uh, we'll be back right after this. This program is presented as a public service by Mount St. Vincent University. Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Greg Malone, and we're talking about his memoir, You Better Watch Out. It's St. John's, Newfoundland in the 1950s. Who were your heroes back then? In the 50s? Oh, my God. Um, I guess most movie stars. Mom was big on going to the movies. She used to take us down to see, like, you know, Mildred Pierce, and Magnificent Obsession. I mean, what, what that meant to me, but Mom was entranced. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, a lot of movie theaters around. So we were, we were big into the movies. And uh, I was very religious too, or you know, so like uh, the, the, the whatever pope was on the go, I was always very devoted to. John the Twenty Third was the greatest guy, of course. That was, he was in high school, but that was the first time I really kind of was attracted to someone in the Catholic faith. That I thought, oh, I saw the difference between the the piety and the person, you know. Uh, so he would have been one of your heroes. Yeah, hmm? yeah, still is. That division between the Catholics and the Protestants in the 1950s, dare I say it was still a pretty great chasm, a lot of prejudice on both sides? A huge chasm, really. Uh, there were Catholic schools and Protestant schools and near the plain shall meet. Uh, it was so funny, my parents, of course, mom was Protestant, dad was Catholic, that was a mixed marriage. And you know, a lot of people frowned on that and mm -hmm. stuff, but I mean, we prayed in school for mom's conversion. And it was God Almighty, you know? <laughs> Because she was Protestant. Uh, yeah, because yeah. she's Protestant, going to hell. So, we're, you know, <laughs> family's going to finally be divided after death. You know, no. So uh, yeah, it was a big divide, and and we lived under that. But it's amazing how quickly it was swept away by our generation. Really, when we got to university, it was like, that's gone. And, you know, we just w went like that with whoever was around and into all the show plays and bands and theaters. They all uh, we were all just happy to meet to be together. You know. I had Protestant friends on the street. That's where you met them, is on the, on the street in your neighborhoods. You know? Not in your schools, for Not sure. in your yeah, schools, Or your no. church. Yeah. No, and lots of times you had Catholic neighborhoods which are mostly Catholic or Protestant, you know. But in my case, I met lots of Protestant kids on the street. And so our generation just wanted nothing to do with that and really we swept that away. That's um, a good change. Yeah, it was a great change. Just like, uh, I think today is the same with um, 
my kids, their generation, like the whole gay straight thing, they don't have anything to do with that. It's all, you were just who you were, you are, come on, like, you know, that's it. Nothing to do with that. So it's good. Your, your book documents some of your personal disasters from your childhood. Anything uh, you want to share with us? It's interesting that um, I wrote some of the more um, harrowing chapters first, more traumatic chapters, you might say. And uh, it was because I was, um, I was reading Alice Miller at the time, who is a childhood, you know, a trauma specialist, really. And she wrote a lot of books called The Drama of a Gifted Child and Repressed Knowledge, Hidden Knowledge and all this kind of stuff. And there were great books about how childhood trauma really affects your whole emotional life as an adult and your ability to be happy or form relationships, you know. So I had some troubling er er you know, areas of my childhood that were still kind of making me <laughs> angry. Like, well, that grade two, four class, I think a lot of the guys in that class, having witnessed what we did, still have a lot of unresolved anger about what went on then, you know, because we felt complicit even though we weren't always the ones being beaten. What was happening in school? You yeah, know? you and couldn't. And so when you mean beaten, you mean literally, literally beaten, beaten by the Until your, your they cried and stuff by the teachers and you're witnessing this and you're just feeling horrible and you're white knuckled holding onto the seat and, you know, all that tension all the year long, it doesn't go away. You, there's a, you felt complicit because you couldn't stop it? or do something when you knew you felt it was wrong. And so, so that left a lot of unresolved anger in, in me and Andy, I know, and I think a lot of the other guys in, in the class. So, so once I've written those chapters and the ones about my father and stuff, which were difficult, that was the most difficult to write. But I did it kind of for my sanity. My mother was losing her memory at the time, and some people were in denial about their childhoods, what happened, and I had to think, well, what the hell did happen? Why do I, you know, do I have any reason to feel this way? It, what, you know, where's it coming from? And so all these things were motivating me to write down those early stories, uh, kind of to keep my sanity. And then when I did that, uh, I enjoyed the process. And then I said, but, but, but Dad in that story, that's not Dad. You know, that I have to give the context. I have to show Dad as the great guy, the, big, the golden boy, the hero, the wonderful guy, the generous guy. You know, so I had, that then was a challenge to make it fuller and more real and really give a context so that it's not one-dimensional, it's more complex than that like it was, right? And uh, so I had to go back and recreate their story. And that was a little harder than my own story, but it was an awful lot of fun. I had a great lot of fun writing this book. I, 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 I can tell you did. I it cried at the harrowing stories and I laughed at the funny stories. And there's a lot more, more funny stories than harrowing stories. All the memories are very rich. They sound very <laughs> you rich. Know, the, the, yeah. And I feel lucky to have had them. Like I say, uh, I love them all. My, beautiful friends and tormentors, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> of which I had both. Greg, we're going to take another short break. Yeah. Uh, my guest today is Greg Malone, and we'll be back right after this. If you'd like more information about this or any of the programs we produce at Mount St. Vincent University, call us or email. We welcome your comments. And welcome back. My guest today is Greg Malone. We're talking about his book, You Better Watch Out. Where did the title come from? Well, um, it's a title of a chapter of uh, one of the stories in the book. And, uh, of course, it echoes the Christmas song, doesn't it? But it more or less means that, like, you know, as a kid, anything can happen to you. You might be, you know, skipping down the street and half an hour later in a dentist office in a life and death struggle in the dentist chair. You know. It, or you might get whacked over the head in school or strapped, or maybe you got rewarded, you don't know why. Maybe you did something wrong, maybe you didn't. It just so you, out of the blue, this stuff happens to kids, you know, at least in our childhood. And it also uh, is a cautionary uh, note to adults. Be careful what you say to kids and how you treat them because, and whether you're fair to them or not, because they remember everything. And some of them are writing it down. <laughs> you may have to live with it when you're, in, you know, when you're much older. Nothing is ever forgotten. You're all, someone is always watching you, so watch what you do, watch your behavior. You must have had a few um, classic bullies oh, yeah. in, the, in that era there. Any, uh, anyone that you'd paint a picture for yeah, us? Oh, the bully. Well, like I say, you, 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 people tended to guard their neighborhoods in those days, you know? You're not getting down my street like without paying <laughs> duty or something, right? And if you got down the street, you wouldn't get back up again easily, right? So everyone, you know, like, you know, the the Walsh's guarded that street, the Dins guarded that street. <laughs> Your course was very circumscribed. Very territorial. Yeah. And there was bullies uh, on the street and there was bullies in the school. So, you, and you just, that was the world. It was a dangerous world. You looked out for it. Yeah. 
And, and some of the bullies in the end turned out not to be such bullies. They just turned out to be guys who wanted to get involved and were kind of rough, <laughs> like, you know. And in, in the end, um, I, I was friends with, with a lot of them. You had a theatrical side to yourself, too. You were in a play with Danny Williams. What was? Um... Yeah, that's probably the first play I was ever in. We did that, that play in, in grade four. What was your role? What was his I role? Was, um, I was the sister, Danny's sister. <laughs> Danny was St. Bernadette Subaru. Uh, he wasn't terribly keen on putting on the dress, but I was more than keen and carried the day. day. But uh, in, in the end, he, as I say, set aside his womanly attire and rose to the occasion. And uh, it was a good play. It was a lot of fun. Uh, was he a bit of a scrapper even back then? Yeah, Danny was, yeah, he was a, definitely a scrapper and, you know, he was not a big guy, uh, yet he was a, a good sportsman, uh, like he was a basketball player and a hockey player and he liked sports. I didn't. And I was the bigger guy, but, you know, go figure. But so he had to punch above his weight to, you know, get respect in that jock world, I guess, right, you know? So our, our paths crossed in different areas. We did a science project together once and... Uh, I was a bit of a mischief maker, and so was Danny. He liked a practical joke and a bit of fun in class, so we often got involved in pranks and stuff like that. <laughs> the Imperial Oil, and they have a summer picnic, they put us all on the train. We, in the Newfie Billet, we get in train in town and chug out two, two hours to a, a rocky field, and they put up tents and amusements and games and flags, and I thought it was, wow, I thought it was the grandest thing on earth. I could barely, I could, I could barely walk, but I, I loved it. And they had Christmas parties and everything too. It was a very much of a family thing, the whole corporation, and everyone knew everyone in, in Imperial Oil, and they were like your family. It's, it's, it's not the same today. Yeah, I knew Andy since grade one. He was my best friend from grade three on, and I used to live at their house, so I saw Kathy when she was just a little tiny girl. <laughs> I knew her from, from the get-go, you know? So uh, all the, a lot of children like that, like Danny and Andy and Kathy, they're all in the book, but they're little children running around, and I think it's so interesting to see them uh, at that stage in their life, just like I was fascinated by my own story, you know, uh, at that stage. But, um, and people ask me, do they say, well, you know, it, uh, they expected to have a book called, you know, Comic Tells All about all the backstage stuff at Cogco and stuff, but that wasn't really interesting to me, and this is... Not so different in a way, really, because on Codco, I spent my life putting characters on stage, and these are all kinds of characters in print. It's just a different medium, but the same kind of thing. And a lot of the characters that found their way onto stage in Codco had their beginnings back here in that childhood, you know. Greg, we're going to take another short break. Yeah. Uh, my guest today is Greg Malone, and we'll be back right after this. If you'd like more information about this or any of the programs we produce at Mount St. Vincent University, call us or email. We welcome your comments. Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Greg Malone. Uh, Greg, what was the um, high point of CODCO for you? The high point of CODCO for me, I mean, I love doing the, the, the television shows. It's so much fun. But like, for raw excitement, when we first brought the first Codco show, Codnistic, home, we, we, we developed it in Toronto, and we, our first audiences were Toronto audiences, and they were really good to us, and we got a great review from Urge Crater. We were having a good... But we brought the show home to Newfoundland, and people just got hysterical. They went, like, you know, they would be screeching in the audience. <laughs> They'd come to the show five times. They knew the lines. They'd be sitting there. After the show, everyone would stay, have, light up a joint. It was like a big rock concert. And that was so exciting to me that, like, this was not theater phobia, man. This is real live theater. Like, we've got all of our generation out there going nuts, and they're coming, repeating the lines to us, and smoking stuff out. It's like a rock concert. You, I felt like we had reached our target audience, reached our generation, and we're talking their language, you know, and that we were doing something really alive in theater, like you read about must have happened in Shakespeare's time when they all came and threw apples and were laughing, and, you know, it was a big was the, the entertainment. So there was really that sense of doing Codco, like it was, a, it was the closest theater I'd ever seen to like a, 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 a rock band. And rock bands were the thing then. Theater wasn't the thing yeah. then, it was rock bands. But if you were gonna be cool, you had to have a rock band, but we managed to be cool in theater. I mean, like I say, myself and Andy were best friends since grade three, and all in high school, we used to get his father's tape recorder and tape shows, <laughs> you know, do characters and tape shows. We listened to, uh, uh, beyond the fringe till it was worn out and, and all the British comedians and stuff and we really wanted to do something like that 
and we never didn't imagine, couldn't imagine how we were going to do it. Coming from Newfoundland, I couldn't imagine how you'd be a, a professional actor, or even as opposed to a comic. Um, but uh, when we did get together, it was noticeable that there was a lot of Irish Catholics in the group, disgruntled Irish Catholics, <laughs> ready to either cry or laugh. And so we decided to laugh and have, have a good laugh at it all. Um, and yeah, our, our, our material is totally informed by all the characters that we saw growing up and the people that we grew up with, the brothers, the, the scouts, the wonderful people like around the bay and in town. Now, like I say, you know, get in a taxi. The taxi drivers are funnier than I am. You'll have a show just going downtown. Mm -hmm. And everyone loves to laugh or sing a song. It's, it's a great place like that. They really appreciate um, words, literature, mm -hmm. wit. Yeah. They love wit and, and, and any turn of a word. And so you're writing to a very appreciative audience in Newfoundland. They mm -hmm. want to laugh to start with, and they're ready to catch on to stuff. They're looking for it, you know, which is a great way to start uh, in Newfoundland. I suppose that's why there's so many writers there. Like my, my parents were great storytellers. My mother and my father would have you on the floor with their stories. They were fabulous. And my Auntie Vera was like the griot of the family, the, historian, the oral historian. She could tell you anything. And so, um, you know, we, and, and, and they knew they were good storytellers too. Because, you know, I'd ask Andy Vera first story, say, wait, now I get my glass of water and I'll set up. Now, how does it go? Well, we were up and so, and she'll start, you know, and it's like a whole performance, the story is. And so Newfoundland storytellers are like that, just in a family. They'll sit down, they'll tell you the story of Uncle Char and how Uncle Char, you know, drowned uh, the boat and got saved. And it's a whole story that's been worked out. And really, when I came to write the book, I, I had that to work with. All those stories from Auntie Vera, Mom and Dad, right? I had them to work with, and I was writing them down, but they were there. What about, the, what was the low point? Well, Cutco. well, Tommy died. Was the, Tommy Sexton. Tommy Sexton died. Yeah. Tommy was the heart and soul of Calico, really. He was the, the, he was the guy who got it going in the first place. <laughs> Insisted that I come over and help him with the show. <laughs> Made people do it. And uh, he was um, kind of the glue, you know. He'd go back and forth between feuding parties and try to calm things down and get the show on the road. And I mean, he was his own troublemaker, too. He was a little Christer, too. But he was awfully good party high energy, wonderful person, really generous, so generous, you know. It was very touching. And all of his, all of the people he touched were, were there at the end, all of his lovers and all of his friends. So that was a great energy uh, to lose, you know, and it was never the same after that. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for sharing that, Greg. Okay. Thanks very much for coming and joining us on the show today. You're most welcome. Nice talking to you, Leslie. My guest today was Greg Malone. I'm Leslie Choice. Thanks for watching the show. I'll see you again.